If you want to get rid of all the ads, just choose the David McWilliams Plus option on Apple Podcasts and you'll hear us without any clutter or noise or ads. Lovely, John. Beautiful. To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? Podcast time. It is late March, John. It the weather, is. the well weather, done, the weather. <laughs> in like, what was it? Weather in like a lion, out like a lamb. March, something, something like, that. like that. And uh, we're just stumbling through. We're just yeah, we sure stumbling are. through that's, life. That's what it feels like at the moment. <laughs> and everything around us is falling apart. <laughs> I know. By the way, John's life and my life are a little bit complicated at the moment. They sure are. And you're reading more books, I see. I, Would I, you lay off them books? I know. That's the books, 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 books. <laughs> what are you reading this week? I'm reading a fantastic biography of the life of Jane Jacobs. Right? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. By a guy called Robert Canigal. It's called Eyes on the Street. Remind me, who is Jane Jacobs? Okay, I'll remind you, Jane Jacobs. We're going to talk about housing later on, mm. right? With Good. John Byrne Murdoch from the FT about how housing in the English language region as opposed to continental Europe. So if you look at developing countries, you take the English language countries, yeah. as in ourselves, Britain, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Why our house prices are so much higher than in continental Europe. That's bizarre. Yeah, so we're yeah, going to talk about yeah. this. But Jane Jacobs, I'll tell you who she was. So Jane Jacobs was this extraordinary woman, self-taught, who single-handedly took on the establishment, the architectural and town planning establishment in the United States okay. in the 1950s and 1960s. Right. She ended up living in Canada because she decided... She was one of the refuseniks and her children were refuseniks from the draft in Vietnam. Mm. And I used to live, believe it or not, one summer on a brilliant part of Toronto called Spadina Avenue. Right. But Bloor, it's a great place, right? A yeah. really nice part of Toronto. She lived on Spadina and there is a monument to her in Spadina Avenue. Ah. That I have actually gone to right. and believe it or not, taken a photo of it. I think tweeted it out a couple of years ago because she's a bit of a hero of mine, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, what she was doing, she was originally from or ended up living in Greenwich Village. And if you know anything about New York and you do, there was a proposal to bulldoze most of the West Village mm. at a certain stage and put a highway going through Washington Square all the way down to the tip of New York, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, a yeah. mad motorway all the way down. And the planners at the time were obsessed with cars. And their whole idea was that the city was subservient to the car. Now, when you think about it now, it seems like one of the worst ideas of the 20th century. Absolutely, right? yeah. But yeah. it was the thing. Yeah. And people thought that basically the whole idea was we'd build these suburbs, we'd build everything around the cars. Places like New York would simply be a bit like Spaghetti Junction in Birmingham. Yeah. They would basically be car genuflecting to the cars all the time. So it actually would turn it into L.A. Yeah. You, ever been, you, you know when you're in L.A., like there's, there's nothing I've there. I've never been to L.A. What? Have you not? No, I've never been there. But do you know what? I tell you, when I went to L.A., I was so disappointed because it was like being out in the Long Mile Road. That's exactly what it's like. Nothing right? against the Long Mile Road, by the way, but yeah, I know what no, you mean. Sure, because it's all low rise, you know. Yeah, and motorways. And motorways, big wide roads. There's no sense of community. There's no sense of street life, nothing. Well, that's exactly, you just, exactly. It's something you drive through. So that's exactly what Jane Jakes was talking yeah. about. So she's yeah, yeah. this very, very clever, very, very brilliant citizen. Mm. And she starts thinking, hold on a second. I can't just bulldoze. Now, she had been radicalized by a trip to Philadelphia. Right. And in Philadelphia, the town planner, she used to write about town planning, but she was never educated as a town planner, luckily for her, yeah. because with education tends typically to come a bulldozing of creativity. Yeah. You know, you learn, okay, this is the way it's done. Well, this is yeah. the way it's done, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that can happen. So she said, look, hold on a second. You cannot bulldoze through what she thought was the most vibrant community, which was the West Village, the whole of Greenwich Village. Mm. And what it was, was Greenwich Village was not low rise. It was like three or four story buildings, very vibrant communities. Yeah, the brownstone things. Entire, yeah, exactly. Entirely diverse communities, diverse in terms of architecture, diverse in terms of class, diverse in terms of what people were doing in the building. So there were shops in the basement, people were living above the building. That's all idea. And the idea, eyes on the street, 
was her idea that if you have a living ecosystem on the street, it will protect itself because everybody's watching out for everybody else. Yeah. So she was saying that one of the problems in developing high rise, okay, really high rise, mm. and putting people, knocking down old communities, which are organic. So she was basically saying that, you know, cities evolve organically. And people come and go, and every street, she used to describe it as the ballet of the street. It was a big ballet, <laughs> right? People were dancing in the street, yeah. and they were looking out for each other. And then the more vibrant the street, the more diverse the street, the safer it's going to be. And that's what real urban living is about. She said, contrast that with putting people into high-rise blocks, and what you will get, you'll get atomized people. The further you are away from the street, i.e. the higher the high-rise, yeah. the less likely you are to engage with anybody. Obviously, what you will have then is you will have no eyes on the street, and then the streets will become derelict, the streets will become dangerous. And ultimately, what Jane Jacobs is all about is sustainable living in dense communities, not, not, not low-rise, dense communities, but only sufficiently dense, right? That if you go really high rise... Like there's a sweet spot. There is a sweet spot. And yeah, that's yeah. what her, her book is all about, you know? Her main book is The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which is a sort of an almost an elegy to wonderful American cities that were conceived in the late 19th century, built up in the early 20th century, and destroyed in the second half of the 20th century okay. when the obsession with the car... Yeah. came to drive yeah. American cities. Now, of course, you remember in Dublin, remember the Dublin road engineers, they were the city planners. And they yeah. used to knock down all bits of it to widen roads and all sorts of... So it's the same sort of obsession came... Same sort of obsession was was very much all over the world. And she'd yeah. say, no, yeah. no, no. But I'll just read, you know, the Boston Globe says, a portrait emerges of an independent heroine who stepped into an area dominated by men. She was Betty Friedan, Rachel Carson and Erin Brockovich all rolled into one. Oh, right. Nice. Right? So it's it's well worth it. And we're going to talk about that because what she maintained was diversity is the key to a living street, a living urban area. And ultimately, she put her in direct contrast to urban planning at the time, which was run largely, not largely, but was genuflecting to a French architect called Le Corbusier. Yes. And Le Corbusier was all about building these brutalist type structures, putting people into, almost like anthills. Yes. Putting people into these buildings that architects love, but nobody else loves. Right. right? Yeah, you know, yeah, there yeah, are those yeah. buildings. Yeah, yeah. And I know that, for example, you know, because, you know, I spent a lot of time down Croatia and Serbia and things. The former Yugoslavia went in for brutalism big time, they had very avant-garde architecture. And actually so the, did London in, in certain parts of London. Barbican around, is a great example. Yeah, absolutely. But also it had a huge impact on the, the riots in Tottenham. They were all coming out of those big estates that were built in the, the 50s and 60s and exactly, 70s. That exactly. were that kind of brutalist, kind of really badly designed, yep. horrible places. Yeah, and, and that's what this is all about. So, so what we want to do is interestingly, you talked about the sweet spot, that we're going to talk to John Byrne Murdoch about why English-speaking countries have an aversion to apartments. Part of that is an aversion to brutalism, right? Mm. So in our heads, we have only two types of living. Either you can live in a three-bedroom semi or you live in a 20-story tower block. Yes. And what he's saying is, no, 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 no. The Jane Jacobs route is there is a sweet spot in the middle. And that's where we should be. But he has a very interesting ideas as to why we have rejected apartment living and the cost, not just the financial cost, but the social cost of sprawl. You mentioned LA, which yeah. is the extreme exemplar, but he's talking about this, the LAization of large parts of the English speaking world and what that's led to. So let's go to London and talk right. to John. Now, you will know that every now and then, every now and then, we have a fantastic, fantastic columnist, investigator, statistician from the Financial Times called John Byrne Murdoch. I first came across John's work during the pandemic. He kept this extraordinarily informative, data-heavy piece in the FT, graphic piece, explaining, you know, what was happening, where the turns and twists in the pandemic were, et cetera, looking at the data, looking at infection rates, et cetera. And I always thought, 
brilliant. We have some guy somewhere for once can actually visualize data in a way which is acceptable or digestible for everybody. And he's since then continued to go down this route. I think we have probably, we were chatting before about the state of health services, the state of poverty, the state of inequality, the UK versus other countries. I then asked John on Twitter, please include Ireland, uh, would you, in some of your stuff? And he gladly did. So that's wonderful. He wrote a piece the other day on housing. And all I can say, it just keeps saying to me, supply, 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 build, build, build. But it's a fantastic piece comparing the aversion in English-speaking countries, Ireland, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, our aversion to apartment living vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And then he takes that out and explains and joins the dots as to why this is having an impact on house prices. Fantastic piece. John, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, great. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, I should say, I'm, you know, my constant, I live in constant fear that someone, some other journalist will figure out how to make graphs and, and I'll be screwed. But for now, I've got it. <laughs> no, no, you've, you've, you've cornered that market. You've cornered that market and, and, and it's yours. And uh, by the way, if you do hear, John has just told us that there is a little beagle, a Cocker Spaniel beagle cross hanging out in the room there that John, so if you hear barks or dogs saying, come on, talk to me, it is Omar the beagle named after Omar, John told me, in The Wire. I think, John, one of the best characters ever to be on the screen. Absolutely. And, you know, just, just like Omar, our dog has a, he has a strict moral code. Right. But, you know, that's what we want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, John, tell me, give me the, give me the, the top line on, the, on this, this piece about, about house prices, because it is fascinating. Yeah, so, um, so I was looking at just the broad issue of um, housing crises, supply, affordability, all of that. And as always, I made a chart and I thought, well, look, something here looks really interesting. So... If you look at housing supply as measured by the number of dwellings per thousand people over the last 40 or 50 years, you take developed countries around the world, what you see is up until about 1980, whether we're talking about these English speaking countries or continental Europe, developed countries there, they pretty much moved in lockstep. There was a gradual increase in supply over time and it didn't matter what, which country you're in, it looked the same. But then since 1980, We've seen that continued increase in housing supply relative to people on, in continental Europe. But in every single English-speaking country, all the six you mentioned there, it's been completely flat, complete stagnation. And I thought, well, first of all, that just strikes me as interesting. For some reason, we're not building enough dwellings in the English-speaking world. And then I looked at the flip side of that in terms of house prices, and you see the sort of equal and opposite picture. The, the rate of increase in house prices has been further and faster and steeper in all of those English-speaking countries than in those in continental Europe, right across the board. So what you're saying is we have stopped building not just apartments, but we've stopped building all homes, all homes. And as a consequence of that, the rate of home building per thousand people has fallen or has flatlined. And consequently, that has to be a significant, significant part of the story as to why houses are so much more expensive in the English-speaking world than they are anywhere else. Exactly. I mean, I mean, the, my first thing was to say, like, okay, well, well, why is this? You know, why have we not been able to increase supply as much in the English-speaking world as these other countries? And that's when I started looking at this question of density. Well, you know, if for any given amount of land, if you can build more dwellings on that, more properties, then that's going to allow you to increase supply faster relative to the sort of amount of green space you're losing, relative to the number of complaints you might get. And that's when we did this, we ran this survey with the folks at YouGov, and we asked people in all of these different countries various questions about housing. So we asked everything from the basic, would you support new local housing in your area, where you tend to get sort of just about net support in any country. But we then went into the specifics of would you support building of sort of single family housing, detached terraced housing. And again, you get pretty solid support across the board, but then you say, well, would you support, let's say a three or four story apartment? What about a five or six story apartment? And that's when you see this really steep gradient where you've got pretty solid support on continental Europe for those kinds of places. And anyone who's been to places like Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Barcelona, that's what those, those cities look like. But you ask that same question in the US or especially in the UK and people say, no, I, I'm happy with low rise, but I don't want apartments. And I just thought that's that's really striking and could absolutely play a role in why we're struggling to to build enough uh, in the English speaking world. Well, I mean, it's you know you talked about the UK and, and and the US. It's absolutely the case in Ireland that 
the higher you go, and I'm not talking about 10 stories, 11 stories, I'm talking about four or five stories. It's a bizarre thing, it kind of triggers people in a bizarre way, right? This idea that apartments beside you. Now let's come back, I wanna, I wanna, before we go on to the complaints, let's come back to the reality of apartment living. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have a densely packed urban culture, you're going to have sprawl, you're going to have the inefficient use of land, you're going to have all these sort of issues, okay? And you're not going to build enough simply because you need more land to build the same amount of homes. Give me the figures on people living in what percentage of the developed world live in apartments, and then let's have a look at some of these English-speaking countries. Yeah, so so this was, this was really interesting because I thought, well, you know, I, I know there's this sounds like there would be some difference in the types of properties people living in different countries, but it can't be that big. But then when I looked at the statistics, some of this is some of this stuff is crazy. So across the, the OECD as a whole, so this is sort of the, the developed world writ large, about 42% of people live in something that's more than two stories high. So whether that's an apartment or a high-rise block, 42%. Now, that figure in the US, 28%. That figure in the UK, 20%. Australia, 14%. But Ireland, 9%. So just wow. an astonishing, astonishing lack of this dense living in the English-speaking world. So let's let's just focus on Ireland because obviously you're you're talking to Dubliners here on the podcast, but we do broadcast to the world. We do broadcast to the world. I mean, it's not just specific. It's not just the narcissism. It's of, Dunleary World Service. The, this. Dunleary World Service. Yeah, yeah. We're probably, let's talk about us. No, but so so in Ireland, okay, we are the extreme outlier where only 9% of the population live in apartments as opposed to 42% in the rest of the developed world, okay? So not only have we an aversion to building new apartments, but obviously that aversion goes very, very, very deep. And surprise, surprise, we have the highest house prices in Europe, are amongst the highest house prices in Europe. So then let's talk about, so the reality is we don't live in them, and then the reality is we don't want other people to live in them as well, is what you're saying, <laughs> right? It's like, not only do I not live in an apartment, but you can't live in an apartment either. That's really what's, what, what, what you're, you're picking up. Exactly. And you know, I think, again, this is one of those things that to us in the English-speaking world, you're like, well, of course, you know, no one's surprised by that because we live in these cultures where there is such an aversion. And it's whether it's the complaint about, oh, you know, it's going to block the sunlight coming to my garden or your classic US complaint, which is, oh, this is going to bring the wrong types of people into my neighborhood, crime's gonna go up, that kind of thing. But every English speaking country seems to have some version of its sort of go-to excuse for why we can't have this kind of thing. And it's, yeah, it's just it's just really striking. And then you combine that with the, the planning system that, that we see in all these parts of the world. And something people often say is, oh, you know, the UK has this weird discretionary planning system. There's no, there's no sort of rules like you get in a zoning system. And, if we just change to a zoning system. Explain to me the difference between a discretionary planning system and a zoning planning system. Sure. So in a zoning system, different parts of land are zoned for different types of building. You might say, all right, if you're in if you're in this within this boundary, you can only build single family housing, like detached housing, something like that. If you're in this one, you can build something a bit more high rise. If you're in this one, you can build apartments. And most the vast majority of countries in the world do something like that. In the UK, it's completely discretionary. So every time someone wants to build something, they have to put in an application. There are all sorts of different outcomes that could result. People can raise objections, that kind of thing. By the way, so it's precisely the same in Ireland. We have the UK system, but we have done, John, for, for better or worse, I think for worse on many things, Ireland has taken a lazy approach to all sorts of legislation. We just cut and paste whatever you guys do and put a harp on the top of it. <laughs> and and then yes. and translate it and translate it into the Irish language and hey presto we have a system but it's basically yes. it's basically lifted to so every time you want to build let's say I'm a, I'm a builder a developer and I want to build an eight story apartment block beside us here in Dunleary there is no way in which we can accelerate that process we have to go for each individual planning and that's how it works and obviously then each individual planning can have lots and lots of objections is that the issue. Exactly. But but the, the striking thing is that it's, it's not actually as simple as saying, well, it's discretionary versus zoning, because Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US actually have remarkably similar processes and outcomes to the UK and Ireland, despite having zoning systems. Because again, you've got this sort of English common law tradition in all of these uh -huh. countries, which okay. says, you know, there's, we have to be flexible and we have to listen to appeals and, and objections and that kind of thing. Whereas the rest of the world, 
takes this civil law approach, which is a bit more top down, a bit more, these are the rules, this is the system, this is how it works. Now, I'm oversimplifying slightly. No, but, but no, I, I, I get the point. As I've always said, Napoleon is a much, much misunderstood character. A bit more Napoleon, a bit less one of the English kings, and we'd have a better system. No, seriously, we'd have a better plan system. No, because a lot of this comes from Napoleonic law, which is basically the, the state is going to run the show. And the state's going to say, this is how we do it. This is how we educate people. This is how we build roads. This is how we build, you know. And and it, and whereas this sort of, it's kind of Edmund Burke versus Napoleon. So we gave the world Edmund Burke, John, right? Yeah. And Edmund Burke... The, the father of Toryism, the fellow who came up with the expression conservatism, to conserve things, right? Yeah. And obviously because of Edmund Burke, we have common law, or not just because of Edmund Burke, people have thought like that. We have common law system where it's the unique right of the individual to complain and to stand up against the state. And in extremis, what it means is that one individual can hold up a planning process. John, isn't that what we're saying? Exactly. You know, the, essentially, the, the, the concept of NIMBYs, you know, the classic not in my backyard, uh, sure, there's a, a level of that going on in most countries around the world, but it's so much more pronounced in the English-speaking world because we have this system which says, you, you know, you sh if you see something you don't like, complain about it. And if you, if, if you don't want something to happen in your area, it's your right to try and prevent that. And so even in these English-speaking countries with zoning systems, that's still basically where we end up, you know, these sort of planning meetings in the US and places like San Francisco where you've got current residents who are often older and whiter and they're saying, no, I, I don't want this don't want this block coming in, this four or five story building. I think it's going to bring in the wrong people. It's going to bring in crime. And that's how so much of this stuff gets held up. It doesn't happen in the rest of the world. And, and then you, you finish the article and you say something interesting is also about our way of looking at nature and the sort of paradox of nature. Explain that to me as well. Yeah, this is this is one of the things that I think is the most exasperating because there's this this very old tradition in the English speaking world of conservation, the idea of you know it's England's green and pleasant land, it's all that kind of thing of we cherish our green spaces, and what that leads to is very high environmental protection hoops for people to jump through when they're building property. So you have these notorious examples in the UK, for example, of um, large developments, and this is true for infrastructure projects as well, which essentially get held up because they might impact um, the number of a particular species of rare spider. Oh, we have badgers. the same thing. We have we have bees and we have badgers, snails. Snails. We've yeah. got the, we've oh, got yeah. the same thing. We've had we've had motorways that are being held up because of snail populations and all sorts of stuff. And I, and I can see the heart and the head are always conflicted in these. So I can see where the heart is. The heart is saying, "Hold on a second. We have an amazing." ecosystem we have an environment that needs to be protected yep. but on the other hand the head is saying well hold on a second at what cost and you've explained this very well in the paradox of this exactly so again i'm with you, you know i was i was brought up by by you know some of these campaigners as it were so i totally understand the argument and i do you, do you know biodiversity is important but the paradox is by by blocking denser buildings and blocking buildings in general you you encourage this sprawl and so the amount, first of all, the amount of green space that we actually end up building on is higher because you have to build the same number of dwellings, you've got to do it over a larger area. Secondly, that sprawl means you have far more car dependence. So you're saying, I want to protect the environment, but you're creating a built environment where more people need to drive. And then thirdly, just from a general sort of energy efficiency perspective, dense, dense built environments are far more energy efficient than sparse ones. You know, the insulation is easier Absolutely. people have to move around less so so th what we what we say we're doing to protect quote unquote nature ends up harming it precisely because we, we we end up driving more we end up using more fossil fuels to get from a to b all that sort of stuff now let's let's just go back before we conclude so you started with this sort of observation of oh isn't this quite interesting you know people don't really like to live in apartments then you looked at the numbers and you found a oh, hold on a second the english speaking worlds there is an explanation for the fact that people are being priced out of the housing market here. We're not actually building enough. It's very simple. The Europeans, the continentals, continue to build and build and build, and we have stopped. Why have we stopped? Because we seem to have an aversion to density. Why have we an aversion to density? Because it seems to go very deep with our aversion to living in apartments. Why have we an aversion to live in apartments? It could be cultural, but how it manifests itself is a gummed up planning process and an inefficient use of land, 
and an unwillingness to embrace the idea that if you want to solve the housing crisis, you've got to build more homes and you've got to build in a denser fashion. Exactly. And again, there will be other factors at work here, but there does seem to be this this thread running through things that in the English-speaking world, we've empowered people to say, I don't want new buildings. I especially don't want big buildings. And then we, we say that we're surprised when we build less than other countries. Can I just end? I mean, again, remember I started the cut and paste idea in Ireland. So in Ireland as well, we in the late 1960s uh, decided to cut and paste model. I just want to get to the root of the aversion to apartment living, particularly in this last two generations, because that's what we're talking about. Okay, we're talking about something that has happened since the 1980s. In the 1960s, we decided to look at the UK model of urban development. And I think we took probably, given our show, we probably probably took Birmingham and we said, oh, that looks good. That looks modern. That looks glitzy and clean. Look at my spaghetti junction. Oh my goodness. That looks like, that looks like the future. And we went down the sort of Le Corbusier approach of building big corporation high rises in certain areas. And they ended up being areas that went into dereliction very, very quickly. Do you think there's a psychological scar in the English world with regard to apartment dwelling as a general concept? Absolutely. I think you've nailed it. That, that especially because the English-speaking world, and particularly um, the UK, has this strong thing about class. And, you know, in England, essentially tower blocks high-rise has been associated with working class and even with the lower end of the working class. And so people think, well, I couldn't possibly live in a building like that. And I, I should just say as well that you actually get a similar thing in France. So some of your listeners might be familiar with the concept of the HLM or HLM, which are these tower blocks that you get in the suburbs of Paris, for example, which again are very much associated, quite prejudicial association with, you know, low class um, dodgy people. And so the French are actually more anti high rise than the Brits. But crucially, in continental Europe, you've got something between high rise and low rise, which is this strong tradition of lovely, dense apartment building, which we just not really managed to, you know, present that option to people in the UK, Ireland, and, and most of the English speaking world. So what you're talking about is this, is that sort of the, almost the boulevard houseman. I know that's the swanky end of it in, in France, but you know, your six story, seven story apartment blocks, which are, as you say, incredibly well designed. Uh, and how's, I would say, the majority of people, certainly in central Paris, and certainly if you look at Barcelona, it's, it's the classic model of those ones. And there's one area in Copenhagen I cycled through not that long ago. I can't remember. It was incredibly densely populated, but really high-end stuff. I mean, a place you'd love to live. Exactly. And I think that we're just missing that vision of what dense living can look like. And, you know, some people pointed out actually in response to the piece that Parts of Scotland actually do have this. So bits of Glasgow and Edinburgh, you've got those lovely stone apartment blocks. But but yeah, it's it's a we've allowed people to associate high rise with poor quality buildings and again in a very unfair way with certain types of people. And that means that that, that we get this stronger sort of innate um discomfort with those buildings here than elsewhere. And I just I'll leave it at that. And Scotland is the only part of this neck of the woods that doesn't have persistent housing crisis, which is quite interesting. Scots, there you go. You know, Glasgow's much, much cheaper than Dublin. Much, much cheaper. It's a city. It's about the same size. It's a big city and it's much, much cheaper. John, listen, fantastic stuff. We will talk to you again and uh, look after look after Omar there. He was very well behaved, unlike Omar in The Wire. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, John. Great to talk to you. Perfect. Thanks, David. Have a good one. I see seven towers and only one way out. What's that quote from? You too. Is that it? That's it. It's a great line. It's about Ballymun, is it? It's about Ballymun. The seven towers of Ballymun. Hat tip to Bono. Yeah, absolutely. But you were talking about brutalism yeah. before we were speaking to John, John. You know, and that was part of it. But let's talk about that and pick apart some of the things that John was talking about there after this. So is it a kind of um, is it a kind of an issue that we're not building the right kind of apartments? We're not building them at all. That's the problem. Well, it, we're not building them at all. But the ones that we are aren't big enough. They're kind of small space. You know the way there was always this mentality in the UK and Ireland in particular, and and that phrase of you know 
uh, an Englishman's house is his castle yes. type of thing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's hard to have that kind of feeling in an apartment. I wonder, does that feed into it? I, I don't know, I'm does. kind of guessing well, here. Well, I, I, think, I think what John was saying, a lot of it's to do with class, a lot of it's to do with yeah, snobbery, yeah. a lot of it's to do with class stigma. And I think that's what's absolutely going on in, in one part of the psyche. And I think he's saying something very important about English common law that we have. Yeah. And the roots of common law and the rights of the individual vis-a-vis the state. Like, I'm a big fan. I know it's really... I, I think Napoleon has been badly hounded. Yes, you right? mentioned that earlier. Go I, on, explain I, I think, that. You see, so I, I think, you know, what I'm amazed by is because we're, we speak English, we receive a huge amount of English propaganda. As yeah. a general, we just, we just absorb it. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. In the English language, which is largely framed by English people. Right. Mm. And of course, the huge, the most virulent propaganda orchestrated by the English was mainly against Napoleon. Yeah. Because Napoleon stood for an idea that was so much more interesting than monarchy. Imagine he stood for republicanism. Yeah. This is a fantastic idea. Right. He stood for radicalism. He stood for change. You know, most of you are bought into it. We did eventually. We're a republic. Right. Mm. The Brits had a monarchy. Now, how do you do? You win on the battlefield that's one thing but you have to win inside the minds of people and so the anti-napoleonic propaganda which has been relentless in english history in english politics etc has infected irish people i believe yeah with a an ambivalence towards napoleon right and napoleonic laws napoleonic ways of doing things now of course you know edmund burke wrote yes, yeah. again an irishman right an irish conservative the worst type of Irish conservative, wrote this book called Reflections on the Revolution in France. And he wrote it in 1792. And what he was writing about was France, but he was genuflecting to the wolf tone and the notion of the United Irishmen. Mm. And he was calling them Jacobins and radicals and et cetera. Now, this is before Napoleon. Yeah. Napoleon's at this stage is only yeah, knocking yeah. around Corsica at this stage, right? He's a soldier, right? He's, yeah. not, he's not emerging until the turn of the century. But Edmund Burke was part of a philosophical movement, which, is like all philosophical movements, has at its roots a certain amount of propaganda. And the idea was that the French and the French system, by elevating the state, would destroy the gradualism that the Brits celebrated. So the Brits were a monarch. They still are a monarchy. But it's an unusual monarchy in the sense that the divine right of kings at this stage was gone mm. and it was a parliamentary democracy. And that's what our friend Edmund Burke went on about. And at the core of this was common law, which gave the common man the right to stand up against the state, which sounds really good. Yeah, yeah. But the downside of that is that it elevates the power of the individual over the collective. Now, and in, that leads to nimbyism. That leads to a legal system that yeah. actually affords nimbyism. Right. Yes, yeah. An avenue against which to protest. And that, I think, is not at the core of, but is one of the many, many problems with the planning system, which is why we have this discretionary planning system, whereas the French, Germans, Italians, Spaniards have the zoning. Yeah. It leads to a situation where, and it goes back to your idea of community, where the French and Spaniards live much more in apartment blocks, but they live in apartment blocks which are not high rise, but are actually six, seven stories. Mm. So that's the great if you go to Madrid, if you go to Barcelona, that's what yeah. you see. And that is the sweet spot. To go back to Jane Jacobs, if you go to Barcelona, the streets are vibrant. Yes. They're never yeah. ever yeah, dead. Yeah, yeah. And there's eyes in the streets 24-7. So there's some shops open, there can be bars, there's mixed use, there's this, that, and the other. And what you have is a living ecosystem. It's one of the reasons why we like going on holidays there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We were saying the last part to spend your money in deposits. <laughs> go to Barcelona. <laughs> but we come back to this idea that if we don't, the interesting thing is if we don't fix the housing problem, we're going to have a housing rebellion. We're going to have one. We're think, going to have I the Jacobin. Already... Now, this is the interesting thing. This is this is where we'll end, right? The Jacobin rebellion that our friend Edmund Burke was so against, the radicalism of the Jacobin French revolutionaries, was informed by an unequal tax system, mm. right? And therefore, the people rebelled against the king because the king was raising taxes on the punters, which is why when Marie Antoinette says, let them eat cake, they got pissed off. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. 
<laughs> off with her head. Yeah. Exactly. She should have stayed in Austria. <laughs> stayed in Austria. Marie Antoinette, right? But, and this is the thing, the very gradualism that conservatives embrace slows down the necessary acceleration of house building and creates the environment for a Jacobin revolution, not informed by are aggrieved by taxation, but informed and aggrieved by a lack of accommodation. But ultimately, it's the same problem. You don't have a stake in society. And when you don't have a stake, you don't value anything. And why would you? Before we go, John, Lucy has a new track just released. It's yeah. called Slow Dancing with Strangers in Bars. Yes. It's coming ahead of our yeah. first live gig, which is in the Workman's Club. Thursday evening. So just let's have a listen to this one. Slow dancing with strangers in bars. He walks up politely asking how do I do? He's so fucking authentic with that slick pack bro cream hairdo. And I don't like him but I let him buy me wine. I bet he does this all the time. Slow dancing with strangers in bars Somebody holds me like we're trying to hurt sweethearts Slow dancing with strangers in bars Nobody knows me here Don't care who you are I don't care who you are Tragic, romantic, acting so bourgeois Hiding in the shadows, smoking like she's in her own film noir While she's living in her car I guess life comes at you hard I've been watching from afar Slow dance floor the smell of cheap perfume somebody help me out this room i've been slow dancing with strangers in bars somebody holds me like a childhood sweetheart slow dancing 